Welcome to the Canadian Condominium Institute CCI podcast brought to you by the Grand River Chapter. I'm your host, Michelle Dyer. We took this episode of the podcast on the road for a very important topic, navigating bad behavior and mental health in condominiums. Please note that during this episode, we share real life experiences and the scenarios and situations described may be sensitive to some listeners. So just be aware that discretion may be needed. I think we want to open up the floor. Now, having said that, I'm with them on. Everybody take a breath <laughs> and take a drink of water. And um, Is there wine in is there? Yes. <laughs> See, now, now it's just talking my language. <laughs> okay, so Randy's going to come around and take your questions. Raise your hand. Please be patient. He's, he's going to try and run across the room. <laughs> and uh, all three panelists will try and answer to the best of their ability. Okay, let's go. Um, so my question is about um, talking about plans and conversations. What would a plan look like to handle somebody with with mental health issues? Yeah, I think first and foremost, having that conversation with your management team, the property managers, whomever is in place of putting a plan together from a legal perspective, making sure you have all of your, in, in terms of legally what we can do, having education and knowledge around that. Yeah, so having that conversation, first and foremost, with your property manager as to what the safety plan is that you would like to put in place. Uh, if there needs to be, you know, someone from a mental health organization in that conversation, you can absolutely call one of us to be there for that meeting so that we can, you know, case by case basis, right? Um, individual property basis as well as to what you're able to put in place, right? Everybody has to be on the same page to put something in place. So I think starting with like today, start with a conversation with your manager, you as a property manager to be like, we need this to happen. Let's set a date. When are we putting this in place? Let's get a mental health expert in. Let's get a lawyer in. Sorry, if I can just interject with a question. So there would be a plan in place for the property manager. Right. But then would there have to be, a, I would think there would be a plan in place for the boards of directors too, right? Like would it be separate plans or would they all be in one? I would see it as, as one. Okay. I, I, I would see it as, first of all, having a plan in place, a, a policy, sorry, policy, policy, policy. Send this out to your tenants, your condo owners. I live in a condo and I can tell you I have a policy that comes through the email. Probably every three weeks something is happening and they're like, hey, we just want to refer you back to the harassment policy. Yeah. I do every three weeks. I know it very well. I see it. I read through it, and it's it's very clear. We will not tolerate any harassment. So I think that needs to be happening. Communicating to your tenants and owners that hey, there's this policy in place. You can't, you know. Uh, and then in terms of helping an individual, I think is is maybe the question as well. I think that it, it's more of like the policy. You guys are talking about plans being in place, but yeah. like, what, like safety plans. What's yes, like what's included. Yeah. In yeah. So what would be included in a safety plan in order to? So are you talking about on-site yes. management? Okay. Yes. So you've got an on-site manager yep. sitting in a room by yep. themselves, mm -hmm. one door in and out. Yeah. yeah. What kind of things can they put in their safety plan to ensure that they are ensure their well-being? The safety plan would be like a code white. So having some sort of like a code, like. It's very difficult for me to actually like lay it out for you, like right here. I think case by case basis, we need to sit down and chat about it. Maybe Bill has more knowledge as to how to put it in place. I don't work in condos. I can just say that there needs to be a safety plan in place and we should talk about it. Yeah, clearly each plan is going to be different depending on your on-site staffing, whether they have walkie-talkies, whether they have radios or, or cell phones, or whether you're calling head office or whether there's a person in the building who uh, uh, volunteers, maybe a member of the board, to come down to the office if there's an aggressive situation, or maybe your safety plan, since you're all alone in the basement, is just to dial 911. Or a security guard as and well. Each, each situation would be based on the environment that you're in and the resources that are available to help you out in that situation. But I think way more thought process has to go into the management office itself. There's so many management offices that are just a safety hazard waiting to happen. You're in a dark, dark corner, in the corner dungeon of the building, one entrance, one exit, uh, very bad cell signal, 
and you know where's your safety plan? Mm -hmm. So I think you have to give the whole uh, situation a look before it happens. How do we make that manager safe, and how do we make the board member safe? And then you have to extend it to how do we make the other owners safe? So your harassment plan has to include all parties in the corporation. How many property managers in the room still actually like reside in a building or go to a building and hang out for like a day or two? Really, eh? Wow. Okay. It's actually more common, I find, with new builds. Yeah. Really? Yeah. I thought we would be doing away with them by now. Just because of, based on Michelle's scenario alone, I thought we'd be doing away from being at buildings like that. For most part, buildings also staff with agencies where we have on site visits as well, right? So, that's the so there's a safety plan, part of the safety plan. Um, Don was just saying that it, like some of those buildings have on site supers and stuff, so the safety plan can include on site supers too. Okay, you can that's also, you can also include, and I've just been hearing this recently, I don't know that everybody does it yet. You can also include having the management office close, not having an open door policy, and having appointments, appointments. set. Hmm. So okay, next question. Hi, uh, so I know wellness checks have been talked a little bit about today. Like, what kind of criteria would we need to see or have been met for us, even as managers, to be able to request those? Or is it more the family members or personal their personal bubble that would have to request that? No, you can It has to be, is this a person a threat to themselves or others? So that's where the wellness check comes in. So if you believe that this person is a threat to themselves or others, like going the scenarios we talked about, going to a person's door over and over again, that's a threat to this person. That's a threat to their mental health, actually, right? Being harassed like that. Or a threat to the physical too. Yeah, so, you know, this is grounds for, hi, this needs to, yes, this person is a threat to others right now. Could you please put a wellness check in place? You know, we, we don't want to jump to this as a every day, you know. Hey, it's happening again. Can you go over? It's it's kind of in terms of like case by case basis again, right? So with that touch on what Bill was saying, there's nothing in the Condo Act for us to legislate our ability to do it. Correct. But through the wellness check, it gives you that opportunity. And then hopefully through that, an assessment could be made. No, they don't really know. They wouldn't be like they would do the assessment. No, sorry, they would do the check. Yeah. And they, they don't give you any information. That's what Bill's point is. There's no follow up on. Oh, okay. That's because of the privacy act. Right. right. But if they saw that there was a need there, even though they don't engage back with us, would they follow through with their own assessments as needed? I, I think that goes into the legal area, which I, I'm going to let Chris speak on. I know everyone's sort of hoping for uh, you follow step one, you follow step two, you follow step three, and the situation is, is resolved. That's not the case. I mean, the condominiums are creatures of statute, right? Their powers are limited to the four corners of the condominium act. Wellness checks are probably one of those things that go above and beyond the condominium legislation and potentially could help resolve uh, a mental health crisis, but it's something that's sort of beyond the control of a property manager, right? You can call the police, and you should call the police if there's a, a potentially dangerous situation, and the police can conduct those wellness checks, but they're not going to provide, the police are not going to come back to you and give you the information they received from interviewing somebody. Right? That's, that's just not something that they're going to do, and that's just not something the legislation is equipped to handle. So I think the first step should always be to ask a couple of questions of yourself. Is this First, is this something that, is this a mental health issue? If, if it is, at all, it might not be, and you can proceed to with, with the other things. Is this, if it is a mental health issue, is this something we need to involve authorities with now, or is this something that we're, we can deal with under the condominium? Act. Is it a noise and nuisance issue? Is it a dangerous activity under the condo act? But if there's criminal activity taking place or that somebody is a danger to themselves self and others, we have to sort of give that over to the, the relevant authorities, whether or not that be that would be the police, and then take a step back. Like because you, you can only accommodate a disability up to a certain point, up to the point of undue hardship. And undue hardship takes into consideration the health and safety of, of others, including yourself. So if there's a situation that's dangerous, 
or potentially dangerous, call the, call the relevant authorities, and then we can deal with the after effects through the condominium legislation. But the condominium legislation isn't there to, as Bill said, it's not designed to deal with these kinds of situations, right? So we have to rely on the people with the skills and authority to do it, be that the police, be that the community assessment, emergency assessment community. I think there should be like a clear line drawn between harassment and wellness checks. I hope that's not getting muddied here in our conversation. We can chat about this more because this is so hard to just, you know, case by case basis. But like harassment, call 911. Wellness check, you have been working with the family, you know this person, you know, there's a holistic approach that can be taken, right? Can be taken is the big word here, right? But if there is not a holistic approach that can be taken, and I think we all know what that looks like, call 911. So please understand when I say wellness checks, it's it's a holistic approach. Okay, question. So I have a two-part question. Um, firstly, the mobile crisis team, can we as managers contact them? If we do have an established situation, let's say, for example, a court situation, the specific owner doesn't have any personal resources, is that overstepping for a manager, or do we even have the right to call on their behalf? A mobile crisis team not being personally involved with that owner? That would be you, yeah. <laughs> I feel like the mobile crisis team is going to get a lot of calls, <laughs> and Devon's going to be in big trouble. Uh, no, I'm just kidding. A little bit of humor, right? It doesn't hurt us today. Uh, the mobile crisis team, so your question is, can you as property manager, if there's a hoarding situation, which we do classify as um, a mental illness, could you call, yes, uh, if they are a threat to themselves or others? Again, just always go back to that, right? When in doubt, uh, I think Chris or Bill was mentioning that I didn't even know that a unit could collapse. Mm -hmm. I did not know that. So that's a threat to others? Yes. Yeah. Then you know there's a, there's intervention on on that uh, aspect. Uh, you know even just a conversation with the mobile crisis team friends, right? Let's just start there, right? We can just call a crisis line as well. Like Peer Twenty Four Seven is very equipped to uh, you know give you referrals, so you can even start there. Peer Twenty Four Seven. I have some cards and I can leave them. You can call them and say I have this situation, and I'm not sure where to direct this. You know, I was at a panel and they were referring to the mobile crisis team. Can I take that route? You know, just if you want to dig into it a little bit more, you can also speak to them. And we can also chat after and a little bit more about your case. Okay, second part. So, and then the second part of that, if there is an emergency contact or somebody can contact, is there any legal implications to us? As you said, I mean, everyone said here, we're not mental health workers. We're not diagnosing these owners. So we're going off a stipulation. So if I stipulate that this owner has a mental illness and I contact their emergency contact, is there any repercussion to myself as the manager for contacting that emergency contact? And Chris, that? that's, that's, that's a great question. question. Basically, the question was, are there any, any legal implications on a property manager if they contact somebody's emergency contact when there's a, a situation? So I think we've got to be aware of two potential issues, right? And they're interrelated. The first is Section 55 sub 4 of the Condo Act prohibits you from disclosing information about any specific unit or owner to others, right? But then you have to be, you have to think about how did you get that emergency contact information, right? They gave it to you. So they've consented to that in an emergency to contact that individual. And this is, you know, I'm not going to cite a case on this. But somebody is in a, in a crisis and you call their emergency contact and that person takes issue with you calling it. I want to be on the side that says we took the precaution yeah. and called that. And, and go, I, I'd be comfortable going in front of the judge and said we took the precautions to deal with it rather than the whatever consequences are going to be from, from a potential privacy breach. So there's always a, there's always a practical solution. I mean, from a moral perspective, if somebody's in crisis, I'm calling that emergency contact information, and I'll worry about the privacy implications. Got it. Okay, next question. So we're a billing service provider, as we, you know, and so we have our staff are the concierge. They are the superintendents that are in the buildings, and so they have sometimes night workers as well. So they have 
uh, the daily contact, they're the ones often that are in those little offices, in the, the closets, in the basements. We probably currently have, I would say, seven or eight situations like this that we're dealing with with our staff right now. Everything from people chasing our staff naked because they're bathing in the dog wash area, brandishing weapons. It's very serious. And we lose a lot of staff because they are so scared for their life. We do call 911. But I guess I'm looking for recommendations or a conversation of how a service provider um, we can cooperate or have the property managers have our back to protect our workers because as employers, we are required to make sure that these environments are safe, but we don't have the power to actually facilitate the changes. So it's a bit of a catch-22 for those staff, and that's why you see sometimes a lot of churn in the uh, staffing. So. Is that a conversation with the board? Is it um, something we bring up at board meetings? Or is it something, I guess, I would be interested in the opinions of the panel on how to handle that because our, our people are actually increasingly facing addiction issues, homeless issues, people in the building, aggressive violence, and threats against the person. Well, Phil? So? I would uh, say that that is an innate problem in condominiums because the boards are always getting the pressure to keep the maintenance fees down, so they keep minimum staffing. But at the same time, the board is strapped with the responsibility to ensure everyone is safe. So the board should be putting proper personnel and proper safety protocols in place to ensure that those workers, whether they're employees or contractors, are, are safe while they're on site, but at the same time, they don't want to spend the extra money to have a second person on site. So that's the, that's the push and pull of the industry. And I think the boards have to really look internally and say, what's my, what is my real obligation? Is it really to save money or is it to make this a better, safer place for everyone? We do hear that obviously a lot. People as a worker, from a worker's perspective, they're like, I don't get paid enough to deal with my mm -hmm. personal safety. I'm out of here. How, how many property managers have said that? <laughs> so, oh, exactly. um, I don't get paid you enough. Know, yeah. And it's, it's a really undefensible position to put them in. So we end up sometimes having to provide additional security, and we, we have to mandate sometimes, you know, on behalf of our staff. So I guess it's a collaboration from what I can understand with, with, with property managers, but it's uh, a much, I'm open to suggestions. I mean, I can probably <laughs> so, chime in briefly there and there's a sort of a legal aspect to this but there's also a practical aspect and that's so both an employer and the condo whether that has employees or service members on site have an obligation under the occupational health and safety act but also under the condominium act under the condo act it's to prevent dangerous activities from occurring and under the occupational health and safety act it's to ensure employees have a safe and harassment free work environment Unfortunately, the realities are money, right? As I think Christine accurately put it. I, I forget the exact saying. I think it's, a, is it a penny of prevention is worth a pound of cure? Mm -hmm. The hiring of a security guard or having two staff members on site, the cost at the beginning is going to be a lot less than the costs that are going to be incurred when something happens. And fair enough, but as... I can imagine, Bill, as a board of directors <coughs> and trying to keep maintenance fees down, if all of a sudden Christine's company comes in and says, okay, I'm putting in two people and it's going to cost X amount of dollars, I can imagine that would be met with resistance. Am I wrong? It, it definitely is because if they're looking financially as their number one priority. But if the board members really look into uh, case law, directors of corporations are being uh, find thousands and th mm -hmm. hundreds of thousands of dollars for knowingly putting workers in harm's way. Mm -hmm. And the board of directors are those employers. They take that position. They could be personally held responsible for knowingly putting someone in harm's way. When you're developing this plan, at that point in time, the directors will know that there is a risk of safe safety risk for employees in that situation. And they have to address it at that point in time where they can put themselves into the life. But I really think the industry has to mature from being a neighborhood association to being a corporate oversight, which is really what their job is. Amon, do you have something to add? Sorry. I definitely can't speak on process as much as these two folks can. 
But I'm concerned about you, and I'm concerned about everyone in this room. And from a perspective of what is the number one cause of mental illness, it's stress. And oh, can you feel it in the room, Amon? Can you feel it? Yeah, absolutely. I'm shocked. And you know, the, the situations that, the, the sharing that you did is not something that we don't deal with as well, right? Or other folks in other workplaces, right? Like hospitals and other, other so many workplaces come on, right? I used to work at a design agency in downtown Toronto many years ago, and the, there was someone that would, you know, there was, there was a lot going on in front of the design agency downtown Toronto. It was across from a uh, shelter, men's shelter. So, you know, Again, just going back to, can I give you some offerings in terms of how to take care of yourself? Because this is your job. You're probably like, I don't want to leave this job. I am here. Maybe you know, maybe you maybe you do want to leave, but you can't leave, right? Okay, so you know, we can't just like make our you know our our environment at work. We can't magically make it. We can't magically make our board do what we want to do. But can I just offer like? to take care of yourselves and you know if you look roll their eyes like oh here she goes with her kumbaya <laughs> it's not i'm being specific as to like cmha we offer mental health webinars we have a whole list how to take care of yourself self-care compassion fatigue have you heard of that compassion fatigue is actually what you all are experiencing okay you are dealing with some very high intensity situations and all of us in the medical field healthcare, covid all of us are, right? So compassion fatigue, what do you do for your compassion fatigue so that you yourself can keep yourself well? Because the last thing you want is to not be well, right? Yourself. What I think we did do over COVID was we implemented, in addition to our benefits, a mental wellness program for all of our students. Because then they have their own little crisis line because they needed it. These are unprecedented times. In the essence of time, maybe perhaps Christine and Amon can talk after, because <laughs> I think there might be some more conversation there. Um, and let's continue on with the questions, if that's okay. All right. Uh, just, can you just explain, because maybe I'm just not getting it, what's the difference between mental illness and a mental health breakdown? And one you seems like you might know about ahead of time, or one could just be someone having an episode or having a problem that forces them to have a breakdown or illness. Yeah, so a mental illness is a diagnosed condition, which usually requires intervention, some sort of treatment. I, I can't really speak on mental breakdown because that would fall into the same category as to someone is experiencing some sort of a mental illness, you know, anxiety, depression, burnout at work, which happens quite a bit. So it falls under that. So when you say mental breakdown, nervous breakdown, we used to call it as well. That's usually a series of events that has led the person to experience some sort of a breakdown to like take time off work, or maybe there was an episode that you, is that kind of what you're referring to? Right. I, right. So anybody can develop a mental illness at any time. Like I mentioned, stress is the number one cause, and that leads to a lot of mental health leaves from work. So we, it's language, right? I mean, the language that's been offered to you is mental breakdown or nervous breakdown. In, in the mental health space, we would call it like a mental health leave, right? So something has led up to this person having to take some time off work for their mental well-being. They could or could not be diagnosed with a mental illness at that point. I don't know. I'm not clinically trained in terms of you know what has happened in that specific situation to say, uh, but those are usually the events that lead up to uh, taking some leave off of work or even um, having to go to take some time to be at the hospital. Homewood is a place. There are other places as well that you can go and, and take that time. But I do want to also say, I, we can chat afterwards a little bit more about this. And it's, again, it's just language, right? It's like, I've heard of this. What does this mean, right? And this is good, right? Having that conversation. The mental health system is, is very broken. I work in it and I can tell you that it's, it is. We are constantly lacking funding from the government. It's very hard, very, we're very strained. So people do fall through the cracks. You can imagine, right? Mm -hmm. A lot of people fall through the cracks. A lot of these scenarios, people have fallen through the cracks. Loved ones fall through the cracks. You wanna help, you wanna help. Yes. Nobody is helping. 
because most of the time you have to say in this country that you need help for you to get help, right? We know this? Yeah, so we can have more discussion on this after. Thank you, okay, next question. I just have a really quick question. So I have a common element site, mm -hmm. and we have an owner that poses a potential boredom issue, and it has caused infestation in the other unit, which is how I learned about it. How do I go about helping this person because I don't have access to a common element unit like I would in a high rise or something. Right, right, Chris. I'd have to look at the governing documents. <laughs> <laughs> Come on. Oh, Mr. Can quote every, listen, he can quote every section verbatim and you're going to have to look at the documents? Section 117, that sounds like a dangerous idea. <laughs> but he's not giving legal advice, caveat. Yeah. There's no legal advice. No legal advice. That makes me feel bad. So the question was there's an infestation of some kind of situation spreading to. Uh, from one, so as we all know, common elements condos don't have units, right? They have parcels of tied land which fall outside of the plan of condominium. Off the top of my head, I think this that would be a dangerous situation. So there's a hoarding situation. Yeah. So if everybody missed it, there's a hoarding situation in a common element condo, and and the property manager doesn't have access into the condo to resolve the issue. However, the hoarding is causing infestation or rat infestation. I'm assuming uh, infestation across the property. So that poses an issue she just wants to know how she's supposed to deal with that <laughs> and I would suggest call Chris <laughs> <laughs> yes. I, I think you may also find oh, that there are any solutions through your health department if you believe that there's oh. a health hazard for the other units and clearly there's a health hazard for the individual unit and as has been stated hoarding is generally uh, associated with mental illness and so a wellness check might be in line you can always call by yeah. you can in the health department's anybody you can call a health department on anything right so you can on any on any like yeah. property yeah. go ahead next question hi it's not necessarily um a question but more so a comment that ties into a few of the questions prior to me being a property manager i worked in uh, the developmental sector which kind of sisters uh, the mental health sector and i had to call for wellness checks often i can't even tell you how many times i had to call um, each time I would call, if they, we thought that there was a mental health issue, we would say, look, we were pretty sure, you know, they have a developmental issue, but we think that there might be some mental health issues as well. And the police would always send somebody from um, mental health with them to do an assessment alongside with the police. I know that's true for Waterloo and Wellington for sure. So I just thought it was important that everybody knows that you don't necessarily have to, you know, bombard the lines of, of mental health. To do a wellness check, you just call the police regular line and let them know what the situation is, and they're usually pretty accommodating and going out. Um, and the second one ties into the safety at work. Again, we did a lot of after hours meetings, and we had a lot of some people with dual diagnosis of mental health and developmental, and we had portable hand funds that we would have in the office when we knew there was nobody else to be around. Um, and you just put it around your neck or around your wrist, sort of like you do a fob. And if there was any issues, you would just press that and the police would be immediately notified and they would come to site. So that might be something which was an option to. for people that are, yeah, that's good. Thank you. All right, one more? Okay, one Thank more. Thank you, Michelle. All right, so where do we go from here? Uh, looking good through questions of legislative change or advocacy, uh, what recommendations do panelists have for us as condominium professionals or CCI members or CCI boards? What steps can we take to try to affect some of the change we've talked about today? Yeah, I, I would say, you know, education is, is power in terms of any, in any situation so getting yourself educated as much as possible in terms of what mental illness is what these different situations that you're experiencing how you can navigate them by calling a crisis line speaking to them at length about hey there's these situations what are my options calling the mobile crisis line and speaking to them about it as well I'm a property manager in your area I think I might be calling you often you know, just want to kind of get some information as to like, how can you support me? Making a safety plan with your property managers, getting that on your calendar ASAP, right? Putting some serious thought, effort, advocacy. You know, I call myself a mental health advocate because there are things that I'm doing that 
you know, my managers and, and, you know, other folks that I work with, it's, it's really out of their control, right? Like they can't affect all the change that they also want to. But we as individuals, as human beings, can equip ourselves with knowledge and be advocates in our own community and start making that change. So I would really encourage all of you to become mental health advocates in your own community. And then first and foremost, as I always say, take care of yourself first. You know, you don't want to be unwell just because your workplace is, you know, posing these situations for you to navigate. So mental health se seminars that I mentioned that we hold on compassion fatigue, self-care, stress management, all of these things, meditation, finding mindfulness ways. You know, meditation isn't about sitting in lotus pose. I'm from India, which is the birthplace of yoga. I and mean, that's not what we preach. That's a very Western philosophy. <laughs> Eastern philosophy is having reflection and taking care of yourself, knowing yourself, knowing what your triggers are, knowing what you're dealing with, and taking care of yourself first and foremost, and building that, you know, that capacity for yourself because we all have to work and put food on our tables. It's not easy work we're doing, but we have to work, right? So if I can just offer that, and, and I'm here to talk about it more after. Thank you. Bill, where do we go from here? I think we have some legislative changes that could happen, and I, I'm under the understanding that uh, CCI and APMO and CAI have put a joint committee together, a joint committee, three committees, to look at what tools could be given to boards, what changes could happen to the Condo Act to allow a faster intervention. I, I mean, let's face it, uh, mental illness is here to stay. It's not going to go away. We have to have tools to deal with it. The second thing that I think is really important is the industry property managers, boards, have to start from a more compassionate place when they start an enforcement. Because that behavior isn't always related to mental illness, but quite often there's a trigger or there's a deletion in there. So I think we have some kind of responsibility. I know we don't want to put ourselves in harm's way, but some kind of responsibility to deal with the core issue as opposed to the legal issue. Okay. And Chris, from a legal standpoint, where do we go from here? Actually, I'd like to say from a not a legal standpoint. Oh, absolutely. Uh, oh my goodness. Wait, everybody write down the date. Yeah. <laughs> write down the date. <laughs> Thanks, Stephen. It's almost like you planned that <laughs> A couple of takeaways, I think. Education, asking questions, and engage your professionals, right? You're not everything all the time. I think there was a there was a recent movie that won an Oscar. I think it's called Everything Everywhere All at Once. Yeah. You are not everything every everything all at once. Ask questions, and if there's a situation that you're having difficulty dealing with, there are resources available, as Amama and Bill have suggested. There is, of course, legal counsel available as well. But engage your professionals and take care of yourselves. Chris, I just have a comment. You said you know how many property managers are in the room. You can't be everything all the time. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Thank you so much for attending today. On behalf of the Education Committee, I'd like to thank you all for coming. It's a wonderful turnout. It shows how important this session was. And as Chris just said, education is important. Please uh, Google CCI. Grand River Chapter to see our upcoming events, and there's one on the Ontario Education course on money management, etc. So coming up in April, so you want to take a look at that. My personal opinion, the takeaway from all of this is that there's no clear-cut, follow-the-checklist answers when dealing with these kind of challenges. I know when I attended the live session, I wanted answers. I wanted definite. Here's what you need to do. Answers on how to handle difficult clients. But the reality is, it's just not that simple. All you have is the tools around you. Utilize the resources, whether that's documents, legislation, policies, procedures, or people. Property managers, contractors, superintendents, engineers, lawyers, emergency response personnel, or mental illness experts. And don't forget, in all of this, take care of you. My name is Michelle Dyer, and thanks for listening to this episode of the Canadian Condominium Institute, a.k.a. CCI podcast, presented by the Grand River Chapter. Tell your friends this podcast, as all of our podcasts, are available across all major podcast platforms, including Buzzsprout, Spotify, Apple Music, and YouTube at CCI Grand River Chapter. Until next time.